Hello and welcome to 2020 and a happy post-Christmas. Some of you were asking me for a top something in 2019 and I delayed hoping for some snow to get the holiday mood going on, but there is no snow, so I'm recording in my kitchen and yes, I've got a new mic and yes, I've got a new light because why not? Before we get to the best of Marek Drive's 2019, I decided to look at the last decade in car tech and tell you what I think was hot and what was not since 2010, in my opinion. We'll start with the tech which I think you should consider having in your car. The order is pretty random. It seems so long ago it is hard to believe it, but once upon a time USB ports were optional extras, especially in premium brands. The same with Bluetooth connectivity and now Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, one of the first car makers to offer USB and Bluetooth and now Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, as standard, were Hyundai and Kia. Kudos. These days you can have a car without sat-nav, but you can have your smartphone map displayed on the car's screen. Connectivity is, in my opinion, one of the most important features in cars these days, and I'm surprised some car makers, especially premium brands, are still forcing you to specify Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as optional extras. However, some premium brands okay, as far as I know, only Mercedes, have very good integration of smartphone satnav and onboard driver aids. Which leads me to the next point on the list, which are driver aids. Some 10 years ago, a collision warning system in a Volvo saved me a lot of trouble, and since then, I firmly believe such systems are good things, as long as they are well implemented. In some cars, they work against the driver rather than with the driver. However, with good implementation, they take away a lot of stress from driving in traffic or long distances. I like the increasingly popular semi-autonomous driving, something Tesla likes to overhype as the autopilot feature. Increasingly often and for longer periods of time, you can trust the car to drive itself and here is where Mercedes integration with the smartphone stands out. As far as I know, only Mercedes Adaptive Cruise Control works not with just onboard satnav but also with Google navigation, so you can use your favorite navigation and take advantage of the driver aids as well. Information from satnav, including smartphone satnav, appears on the head up display. In my opinion, presenting basic information like the speed limits, the satnav information, and maybe your speed without taking eyes of the road and without looking at the central display is a great thing. Let me go back to the driver aids for a minute. I am a fan of 360 degree cameras, parking assistance, the good ones like in the BMW, as well as reverse cross traffic alert. With a growing number of SUVs and crossovers, it is more and more difficult to reverse out of a parking spot because you can't see anything over the SUV parked next to you. And other drivers are not always polite enough to let you complete the maneuver. That's where reverse cross traffic alert is a good thing. Another point on my list may not be a safety feature, but boy do I like my heated steering wheels. Once reserved for luxury cars, today heated steering wheels appear even in super minis. Here in Poland, I use heated steering wheels in test cars for at least six months every year. Once you try, you'll never want to go back. Now, watch out for some Lexus models where the Japanese engineers decided only quarter to three points need to be heated because this is the correct way to hold the steering wheel, so the rest doesn't have to be heated. Don't get me started. Okay, this is the most important point on the list of useful car tech of the last decade, and I'm talking about hybrids and electric cars, of course. Toyota took hybrids mainstream. There are now also plug-in hybrids and micro-hybrids. The latter can bring noticeable savings in case of larger displacement engines. And then there are electric cars, mass produced for about 10 years, they finally got to the point where the range is decent and we will see more such cars in the months to come. And now let's talk about the tech which we could very well do without in our cars. So we'll start with night vision. There was a time when Mercedes, Audi and BMW competed to have the best night vision system in their flagships. One was infrared and the other one was heat seeking. It was cool to see someone else's hot exhaust in traffic, but driving in the dark, looking at the screen instead of the road ahead. I recall taking a test car equipped with such night vision system for a drive one winter night, but I was neither feeling safer nor less tired. Virtual mirrors. 
This futuristic tech was supposed to replace side mirrors because of aerodynamic benefits. I think the only case of broader implementation right now is Audi e-tron, but even there it's an option. Meanwhile, Toyota and JLR are pushing the virtual rearview mirror. Theoretically, it eliminates a lot of the C-pillar blind spots and helps with the visibility when you have tall passengers in the back, but how often do you drive with three NBA players in the rear seat instead of kids? My main problem with these virtual mirrors is eye accommodation between 3D and 2D. My partner says she doesn't have that problem, but clearly she's blind, otherwise she would have dumped me a long time ago. The next point on my list of obsolete car tech is a broad array of consumer electronic fads which just don't work in the car industry. For example, in-car video entertainment screens. The player would usually work in some archaic video format and plugging anything else in was even worse. Kids these days have tablets and smartphones to play with. Speaking of tablets, BMW and Audi added tablets to their flagship models. Instead of pressing physical buttons, you're supposed to adjust settings for the rear passenger compartment on a tablet. The Android app is bad enough, but you also have to connect to the car Wi-Fi hotspot to make it work. I can't imagine a corporate honcho trying to set it up. I mean, come on, it's not happening. Living in the same category are dedicated car apps. They take up a lot of space on your smartphone and they take ages to connect to the car and then the connection drops and it's just faster to go out to your car and turn the heating on yourself. But this doesn't stop the car from sending you multiple messages where you've parked it. Thank you. I know, and I don't want to share my car with my friend who needs the right smartphone, which I have to authorize. No. I also don't want an armband to open the car in which I left my keys and I went surfing, and I don't want remote parking. It looks cool when I stand next to the car with remote control or a smartphone and I control the car, but I can just as well do a Catherine Zeta Jones through the boot. And park out faster or just as fast and I'll look just as ridiculous. Voice commands. They kind of sort of work in Mercedes but that's kind of sort of and only in one brand. Not much for years of attempts. It's going to take a while before we'll be able to reliably communicate with our cars using voice commands. And finally, the worst tech thing ever. Retractable door handles. I understand Tesla, which was designed by guys who think blue LEDs in their overclocked PCs looked cool. Also, from a distance, it's easy to tell if the car is open or closed or broken. But then there is safety. Engineers can assure us that door handles will pop up if the car senses an accident, but this one time they won't and rescue workers will lose precious seconds. Land Rover, DS and others. Don't do it. And why did they bother with these retractable kind of door handles in a Porsche 911. I mean, they should be saving weight rather than adding electric motors. Now, this is taking a bit longer than I expected, so now let's quickly jump to my summary of what happened on Marek Drive's YouTube channel in 2019. You clearly liked Suzuki Jimny, Toyota Hilux, Range Rover Evoque, Mazda CX-30, and a comparison of Mercedes-Benz GLE and Range Rover Velar. If you asked me to choose a car for myself from the ones I reviewed this year, I would have to make a list. It would include Mercedes-Benz S-Class Coupe because it's a luxurious couch and I love my couches. The BMW 3 Series G20 because BMW improved what was broken in the F30. The Citroen C5 Aircross because it is affordable, comfortable and interesting to look at. The Mercedes-Benz B-Class because this body type is disappearing from the mass segment and this is the best combination of a compact car and a minivan. The Kia e-Niro because it is one of the first mass-produced electric cars with decent range. Jeep Wrangler because it is always an adventure. The Porsche 911 because it's the best sports car which you can drive every day, not just on Sundays. And Renault Clio because Renault fixed everything that was broken without touching the stuff that didn't need fixing. And if I were to spend my hard-earned money on a car, I would love a long-range electric SUV. If you don't know why the Mercedes-Benz EQC doesn't fit that bill, watch my review. By the way, reviews of all the cars I talked about here are linked below this video. 
The Kia e-Niro and e-Soul sound good, but they are still not available in Poland. I have it on good authority that BMW 3 Series plug-in hybrid is going to be an estate. Interesting. Or maybe there will be an interesting electric car appearing sometime soon? Who knows? This is going to be an interesting year, maybe even a breakthrough year in the car world. This year I will try to experiment with some new formats, as I promise every year, and I will take several cars on longer road trips as they deserve to be presented in the right environment. So, a lot of adventures ahead for you and me. Drop me a comment below which one of my 2019 reviews you liked the most and which one was the crappiest, and which tech do you think is indispensable and what you can do without. Thanks for another year together, and join me next Friday for another car review. I'll see you then.